Hello and welcome to the session. This is Professor Farhat in which we would look at how firms issue securities or raise money. This topic is covered on the CPA exam BEC section and the CFA exam, also covered in an undergraduate or graduate of essentials of or principles of investments. As always, I would like to remind you to connect with me on LinkedIn if you haven't done so. YouTube is where you would need to subscribe. I have 1,700 plus accounting, auditing, tax, finance, and Excel tutorial. If you like my lectures, please like them, share them, put them in playlist. If they benefit you, it means they might benefit other people. Connect with me on Instagram. On my website, farhatlectures.com, you will find additional resources to supplement your accounting education, your finance education, study for the CPA and the CFA exam. Let's go ahead and start by looking at the need for money. Obviously, each firm, whether it's small, large, medium, private, public, they need money. So firms need to raise capital to help pay for many investment projects. You need money. I mean, you're going to make a profit, but that may not be enough to expand. Therefore, you need money. You need to raise funds by either borrowing. You can either borrow money or you can sell shares, sell stocks. So simply put, if you remember the accountant equation, and hopefully you do, and the accountant equation says that assets are equal to liabilities plus equity. What does that mean? It means liabilities, borrowing debt, and equity is selling stocks. This is basically how companies raise funds. This is how they raise money, either to start or to, or to sustain themselves. Now, we have to understand that we have, we're going to break the type of companies into two types. We have private and we have public because the way the private finance themselves will be different than the public. So we're going to break this discussion into, let's look at how private company do things. What are the characteristic of private companies? Let's look at public companies. How they, how do they do things and what are the characteristic of public companies? Also, we want to differentiate between the primary market and the secondary market. What's the primary market market for new shares of securities for new issues when the company first issue sells the stock let's assume facebook sells the stock to the public this is a new issuance it's a, this is the primary market now the public then sells it to other people in the public then the public sells it to another person in the public and this public sells it to another person after they buy the stock they trade it when this happens when the public i'm gonna after the first individual this is the primary market. When these public exchange the stock among themselves, it's called the secondary market. Market for already existing securities. So simply put, not every time the stocks are sold or bought, Facebook is affected. Facebook is affected when they sell it first to this individual. This individual gives them back the money and they give them stocks in return. And that's that. Then the public trade those stocks in the it's what's called secondary market. It's very important. So the issuing company is not involved. Simply put, Facebook is not involved. So we're going to start by talking about private companies. And when I think of private companies or private firms, I like to think of a company called Wawa. Um, if you are from New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, I don't know, Virginia, maybe North Carolina, Florida, we have this convenience store called Wawa. They have a great coffee. I love that place. My son loves it too. So I, we visit that place very often. But Wawa is a private company. Is If Wawa was a public company, I practically will invest all my money in Wawa. Okay. But let's talk about private companies. Private companies are relatively young or small. They don't have to. They could be large as well. Others may be well established like Wawa that are still largely owned by company founders. And basically Wawa is still owned mainly by the family or friends, friends and other investors friends and other investors so simply put wawa is if i have to buy stocks in wawa i have to find someone who owns the stock now i spoke to their manager like when i when i visit the store i speak to the manager or to the employees if you are not working with wawa you cannot own the stock so they do the, the employees do own some stocks but you have to work there you have to work there so and if you and if you leave my understanding is you have to sell it back they will buy it back from you Okay. So no requirement to issue financial statement. The first thing about public uh, private companies, they don't have to issue financial statements. Simply put, they don't have to prepare financial statements if they don't want to. Why? Because the family, it's 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 you know what's going on. If you don't want to issue financial statements for anyone, you don't have to. As a result, you're going to save cost. So they don't have to issue financial statements. That's in contrast. That's in contrast to public companies. Public companies will see they have to issue financial statements. 
and not issuing financial statement will protect you from competitors because when you issue financial statement you reveal certain information that your competitor can use so that's going to shield you from your competitors and you have more time to pursue your strategic goals so rather than focusing on the financial statement um, you can have your focus somewhere else and again as i said shares by Private companies could also be held by managers as well as investors. So people that work at these companies, they might own some stocks. Now, there was recently a few changes about private companies. The Jumpstart Our Business Startup Act of 1912, two, not 19, 2012, the act called the Jobs, it increased the number of owners from 500 to 2,000 before you were limited to 500 owners in, in certain companies. And what they wanted to do, they wanted to expand the pool of investors. Because if you want more investors, well, you got to change the law. You cannot limit the investors to 500. Also, what they did is partnership. For example, a partnership could have 10 investors. It's counted as one investor. So you could have 10 people form a partnership, then invest in the private in a private company and allowed to engage them in crowd crowdfunding they can raise money without going through the sec how, how do these companies these private companies raise money as i told you you could use friends families connection but usually they are allowed to do what's called the private placement private placement is basically selling quote unquote to the public so private companies selling to the public you can sell uh, you could have a what's called the primary offering to which shares are sold directly to small group of institutional investors. So you have to understand you cannot sell it to anyone. You have to sell it to a group called institutional investor, which it means they know what's going on. It means they can protect their interest. They understand the business or wealthy investors. All the wealth, wealthy investors is defined as somebody who has a certain amount of money. I don't remember the exact number, but simply put, wealthy investors, they have the time, they have the money to hire lawyers, accountant to vet those companies therefore the public don't get involved so the sec does allow you something called rule rule 144a of the sec allow private companies to make these placements without preparing the extensive and costly registration required for public companies so they can still they can still sell some some shares but it's not the, to the scale of to everyone like public companies only to wealthy investors and institutional investors what's what's called knowledgeable investors look if you made a bad investment and you're a wealthy investor that's your fault if you're an institutional investor and you made a lousy investment that's your fault that's not the sec's fault okay but bear in mind these shares they don't they, they don't have a secondary market although they might have something similar to the secondary market now why the secondary market is important why the secondary market is important is because you lack you lack liquidity you lack liquidity if you don't have a secondary market what is liquidity it means you cannot sell your shares fairly quickly on a short notice so if you have the stock of a private company and you want to sell it you're not going to find the buyer real quick if a publicly traded company i'll open my computer and today i sold some shares and i click on the sell button and it's gone so it's liquid private companies are not liquid so investors demand price concession to buy a liquid security so if, if i want to find someone to buy my shares well that someone already knows i'm trying to sell what does that mean if i am if i am supplying something the person says well you need to buy it i'm gonna lower my price why because you need me there's no there's no market for your security okay now now more recently though some firms set up computer network to enable holders or private company stocks to trade among themselves for example facebook used to be traded on this network so basically you have private companies that have their own network like their own trading network okay but unlike the stock market regulated by the sec you have to be careful these networks re require little of financial disclosure so they don't tell you what's going on in the company they don't issue financial statements so you're basically taking more risk okay and provide correspondingly li little oversight of their operation so basically no one is overseeing what's going on simply put okay skeptics worry that investors in this market cannot obtain a clear view of the firm indeed when you when you when you buy when you buy these stocks guess what you are you are flying blind and no one is going to protect your interest because they are private private basically private stock market okay the interest the interest among investors and the firm is not really known and the process by which the trade firms shares are executed you really don't know who bought your shares or the process because it's a private network so only people who knows what's going on deal with this private uh, private network so this is what we're going to talk about about private companies how do they raise money now we're going to move to public companies public companies are a little bit different from the word public it means they are publicly traded 
It means now Facebook is publicly traded. So in a private firm like Facebook, remember Facebook was private. All companies start private. Actually, all companies start very small. Then they become private. Then they go public. So when a firm, when a firm, uh, when a firm goes from private to public, is to do what? Is to increase, to raise capital and increase the number of investors that could invest in them, open themselves to anyone and everyone. This is part of being going public. It means anyone can buy your stock. You open yourself to the whole world. Okay. So the first issue of shares to the general public is called IPO or initial public offering. So the first time Facebook sold their stock, it's called initial public offering. If my memory serves me right, May 2010. I still remember. And we're going to talk about IPOs more in a moment. So when the first time you sell your stock, it's called IPO. Then you have something called a seasoned equity offering. Seasoned equity offering, it means the firm uh, may go back to the public and issue additional shares of stocks without going through through a through a formal process. Like if Apple wants to sell more shares, they don't have to go back every time to the SEC. They, they are considered seasoned equity offering. It means they've been offering stocks for so long, we should trust that, you know, they're not going to lie or defraud the public. Okay. Shares of publicly listed stocks are continually traded on a well-known market such as NYSC or NASDAQ. And this is an advantage over private, over private companies. Private companies, remember we talked we talked about liquidity. They lack liquidity. Well, guess what? Public companies, on the other hand, they don't lack liquidity. Why not? Because they are publicly traded. You can find, as I told you, I just sold some some of my some of my uh uh some of my uh, some of my Apple stocks today. It was very simple process. So there's a, a private. So any investor can choose to buy uh, for his or her portfolio, or actually sell for that matter. Um, f sell for that matter. Okay. These companies are also called publicly traded, publicly owned, or just public companies. How do how do these companies raise money? Okay. So how do they raise money? Well, we said. Private companies, they can ask friends, families, connection, as well as have private placement. How about pr public companies? Well, the reason they went public is to have public offering. Public, it means they can sell stocks and bonds for anyone. Bonds means that. They're typically marketed by investment bankers who is the role, who is, who is, who is in this role are called underwriters. Simply put, they would hire an investment banker like JP Morgan, who is considered an underwriter. For example, Google, when Google went public, they sold their stock directly to the public. So they took out the underwriter role. That's a different story, but we'll, maybe we'll talk about it later. Okay. So you could have more than one investment banker usually market the securities because not one specific, not one specific uh, underwriter would like to take on on selling all the shares. What if they could not sell them? There are specific rules for that. So what they do is they 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 uh, they form a syndicate with other people. Um, a lead firm, uh, a lead firm of an underwriting syndicate of other investment bankers to share the responsibility for issuing the stocks. Again, you don't want to take over this by yourself. You want to have other people helping you. In other words, helping you sell the stock because if you cannot sell it, you're going to be stuck with it. And sometimes most of, you know, sometimes you'll be happy getting stuck with some of those stocks because they go up in value eventually. Okay. Investment bankers advise the firm regarding the terms of which it should sell those securities. So they tell you how much you should sell them for the price of the the price of the security. They, then what we have is we have what's called a preliminary registration statement that must be filed with the SEC describing the issue and the prospect of the company. What is basically put? What is a preliminary registration is when the company tell the, uh, the SEC about themselves. You know, they'll give them financial statements, audited financial statements. What's their plan? Uh, what's their plan? What's their business plan? What are they planning? To, what are they planning to do with the money? What's their business goal? So on and so forth. Now, w when the statement is final and approved by the SEC in the final form, it's called the prospective. This is called the prospective. This prospective is basically it will tell you everything you need to know about the company before it goes public. You know, they're say basically we're looking at their income statement, balance sheet, um, cash flow, notes any additional disclosure, okay? At this point, the price which securities will be offered to the public is announced. Once you have a kind of a perspective, it's ready to go, then the price is announced. So, but let's go through a typical underwriting process. How does it work? In typical underwriting arrangement, the investment banker, JP Morgan, purchase the securities from the issuing firm and resell them to the public, okay? The, the leading, 
the leading firm sells the securities to the underwriter syndicate for the public offering price less a spread that serves as the compensation to the underwriter. So the underwriter, for example, buys them for 100, sells them at 101. Well, they need to make money. That's that's the spread. That's the spread. That's their profit. The process is called a firm commitment. This process is called firm commitment. In addition to the spread, the investment banker may also receive shares of common stock or other securities of the firm. Sometimes what they do, they'll give you a piece of the company. Like they'll give you two, three, four, five percent, and you can keep four later, which is hopefully the stock will go up. That's the whole purpose of it. Okay. So this is what the picture looks like. This is the issuing firm. This is Facebook. This is JP Morgan. And they can, JP Morgan can hire other investment banker, but JP Morgan will be the lead and they sell it to the, to the public. Um, and, and, and in terms of uh, Google, what Google did, Google eliminated the step and they went directly to the public, what's called the Dutch auction, I believe. Also, companies what have the option to have what's called self-registration. It allows the firm to register securities and gradually sell them in the following two years. So what you do is uh, is uh, is buy the st uh, have the stock registered and sell them later in the next two years. So you don't have to go back and go through the same process with the SEC. They're called self-registration because the securities are the securities the stocks are are already registered, so they can be sold on a short notice with little additional paper paperwork. So you don't have to go back and waste time. So if you need money, you can sell those shares. And those, they can be sold in small amount without incurring substantial with a fee cost. You don't have to pay a fee cost. The reason they're called on the shelves, it means they are ready to go. That's what, you know, shelf registration. They're on the shelf. If we want to sell them, we can sell them immediately, like in a store. Let's go back and talk about the IPO initial public offering. Uh, basically, the investment ban banker manages the issue of the new of the new securities to the public. As we said, you know, think of J.P. Morgan. Once the SEC has commented on the registration statement and a preliminary prospectus, remember we talked about prospective is distributed to the interested investors. The investment banker, the investment bankers organize roadshow in which they travel around the country to publ to publicize. Now they don't have to do this anymore. They could do it online. The imminent offering. So once the prospectus is ready, we're gonna go and we're gonna they're gonna go and solicit interest to find out how much interest is there in those stocks. So the roadshow serves two purpose. They generate interest among potential investors and provide information about the offering and what they build the book. They provide information to the issuing firm and its underwriters about the price of which they will be able to market the securities. At this point, they're going to have to start to have a better idea about what the price is. Okay. Large investors communicate their interest in purchasing shares of the IPO. So investors, they'll tell you, okay, I'll pay 30. Some will say pay 28, some 32. So you'll start to get an idea okay these indication of interest are called book and the process of polling potential investors is called book building this is what you're try trying to see what is the interest in this company how how much interest can we generate in selling those stocks so the book provides valuable information to the issuing firm because institutional investors often will have useful insight about both the market demand and for the security as well as the prospect of the firm and its competitor look they have the perspective, the investors will have the perspective. Now they understand your business. At this point, they're gonna make a decision. If they like your business, they're gonna say, okay, we'll buy the price at 32 and we want to buy 500 million shares. Some other company says, well, we'll pay 25, we'll buy 100 million shares. So you'll start to have an idea, what's the demand in the market? So it's like, those are valuable signals for it, for the underwriters as well as the company. They will know how much interest, how much interest the public have in them. It's common for investment bankers to revise both their initial estimate, um, the initial estimate of the offering price and the number of shares offered based on the feedback. Remember, if there's, let's assume they want on this roadshow, virtual or real roadshow, and they did not find any interest, they did not find any interest in the investors. So what's going to happen is as a result, uh, they, they're either going to lower their price or the older price or lower the number of shares offered because there's not, not, not enough interest. If they find out everybody wants to buy the stock, then they will do exactly the opposite. They would raise the price and they will tell the company to issue more stocks. Okay. So now we're going to talk about possible explanation why I IPOs are underpriced. What does it mean underpriced? It means they get less money than what they should have. That's what underpriced is. And then we're going to look at some possible explanation. So the first thing is why do investors 
truthfully revealed their interest in an offering. So when 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 the underwriters go on on the roadshow, when the underwriters go goes on the roadshow, why do investors tell them the truth? Like how much do they want to buy? Well, guess what? If they don't, then they don't buy the number of shares that they want. If let's assume you like the company, but you don't want to tell them you want to buy 100 million shares. You tell them you want to buy only 20 million shares. What's going to happen is they're going to think you're only interested in 20 and they might find someone else to buy the 100 and you're going to lose that. So if you have interest, you have to show the interest so it shows in larger allocation. Okay, so you have to show. So you, from the investments perspective, you have to show your interest. Okay, so from the underwriter's perspective, the underwriter, they have to be very careful. They need to offer the securities at a bargain price to these investors. Why? Because they want to entice you to participate in this book building and share their information. So, so you're going to kind of, you, you're, in a sense, they're both working against their interests in a sense that the investors, it's not in their best interest to tell the truth, but they have to. And the underwriter, it's not in their best interest to give you a bargain price, but they have to. So both of you are trying to meet someplace in the middle. So as a result, what happened is commonly IPOs are underpriced compared. To what, why do we, why do we mean it's underpriced compared to the price of which they eventually sell, especially the following day. So that's why we mean it's underpriced. That could be one possible explanation. Such underpricing is reflected in the price jumps that occur on the date when the shares are first traded in public in the in the public market. Okay. So in 2017, when Snapshot Snap Inc. went public, Snap is the uh, Snap Inc. the parent company of the Snapshot. Snapchat was was typically an example of underpricing. The company issued 200 million shares at $17. That same day, by the end of the day, the stock was traded at $24.48. 44% then what they thought the price should be, 17 Okay? So simply put, what happened is Snapchat, the parent company, lost the difference. So basically, they lost $200 million times approximately $7.48 because they could have. Because the price ended up at $24.48. There was interest, but they did not raise the price. So that's... Part of it is the underwriter is careful and uh, and and the investor is, um, you know, trying to show interest in the company. So there is kind of conflict in one way or another. OK, well, the explicit cost of an IPO tend to be seven percent. The underpricing is also considered the cost of the issue. Um, simply put, it's going to cost you around seven percent to go public. That's what we're saying here. OK, for example, if if Snap had sold its shares at twenty four forty eight. That investors obviously were willing to pay for them. The IPO would have raised 44% more money than they actually did. So they left some money on the table. That's basically what they did. Okay. In this case, far exceeded the explicit cost of the stock issue. Nevertheless, underpricing is very common and it's a universal phenomenon. So it's always, um, that always happened. Part of it is ego. A lot of people, they want to buy this new company that same day or the following day because it's, it's it's like there's a lot of rumor about it. Nobody knows anything. Nobody wants to miss out. And sometimes now it's becoming self-fulfilling. If all companies, they go up on the same day or the following day, so it's a guarantee profit. Let's all buy. It becomes a self-fulfilling. If people buy, the stock goes up. Oh, yes, IPOs are underpriced. Not really. Maybe it's the whole psychology, believe, when an, when, I, when an IPO comes to public, it's always overpriced, underpriced. Therefore, the, a day or two, it, 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 it goes up in value. And this, this phenomenon is, is showing in the U.S. as well as outside the U.S. So this is the average first day return on mostly European IPOs. And this is non-European IPOs. And obviously, in the U.S., the same thing. They always... They always trade, for example, in Greece, some IPOs trade at 50% more the following day. But again, it ranges, it ranges. Um, but the point is, IPOs, usually they're underpriced, historically speaking, from a, from a research perspective. In the next session, we would look at how securities are traded. As always, I'm going to ask you to like this recording, share it, subscribe. And don't forget to visit my website, farhatlectures.com, if you're planning to supplement or complement your accounting and finance education or help you pass the CPA or CFA exam. Good luck, study hard, and stay safe.